Our next speaker is uh, Timothy Lillicrap, uh, Timothy Lillicrap from uh, Deep Brain in London. Okay. Um, Keep mine. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, okay, uh, so I, I'm going to talk today a bit about um, something I've been interested in for, um, for a long time, which is um, backprop uh, and the brain, and whether backprop has anything to tell us about it, and how I've been kind of thinking about it for a while. There's lots of people that have, have been involved in some of the work I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to be kind of just going through various pieces. I'd particularly like to just note um, uh, Sergey Bartonov and uh, Jordan, who have uh, done especially some of the experiments that show up in this. Um, but yeah, there's lots of people in, in, involved in all of these things. So um, I've, I've kind of, uh, I guess this, this, this slide um, is about the, the credit assignment problem, which I think um, uh, comes up uh, in Cortex all over the place, which is that ba basically this, right? That um, if, if something, some information comes into a primary sensory area, um, and then eventually that leads to, leads to a motor um, a motor uh, output or some sort of associative concept area where you're forming some decision about something, um, then there's, you know, there's some sort of series of processing along the way. Um, and really, the behavioral effects, those downstream behavioral effects, um, depend um, on those, the, that earlier activity um, and, and on the, the, the whole chain along the way. And in some sense, the, the, the problem uh, for the brain is, is how to say, how to adjust those, those say, those blue synapses. Uh, in abstract, based on what happens in the downstream um, behaviors that take place. Um, and I think it's fair to say now uh, that effectively this is, uh, this, this problem uh, is, is in artificial networks, um, essentially it's solved one way, uh, and that is with backprop. Um, so we, you know, we compute the derivative of some error with respect to the weights on our network. Um, and we update uh, parameters. And there's lots of things like Atom and RMS prop that are, are sort of better than just standard SGD like this. Um, but they all basically just make use of backprop to compute, uh, to compute the gradients um, and make updates. And I want to make a point here that this is, this is also true. And I'm actually going to hit this point a little harder uh, later, too. This is also really true not only in supervised cases where we're doing something like ImageNet, um, but also in the reinforcement learning algorithms that have been successful recently on hard problems um, and in unsupervised uh, cases. Right? So all the best unsupervised algorithms we're running as well are all under the hood. So people are training them with backprop. Um, and so I think it's sort of worth, worth inquiring, you know, does backprop have anything to tell us about uh, how the brain is doing hard problems? Um, and it's, a, it's, it's probably a, even now a bit of a contentious problem. Uh, contentious proposal. It certainly has been. Uh, but maybe it's becoming less of a contentious proposal. OK, so um, right. So, so uh, I think neuroscientists have been happy with the idea. I mean, just, just to flesh this, this out a bit more, happy with the idea for a long time that we have, uh, we have learning rules that operate on sort of, um, sort of two layers or, sh or relatively shallow in some sense. Um, but in a in a, a network that's got a, a, a network that's deep in some sense, um, then in order to credit, uh, you know, this synapse down here between A and B, I really need to know something about the downstream structure of my own brain, right? Um, and that, that that's what backprop says, and that's indeed what um, I think to to do learning effectively you should do. Um, and so there's a real question about how to do that. You should know something. How to know something about the structure of your own downstream uh, brain and how to use that to make updates in earlier layers. Um, so just to, to recap, um, I'll spend a bit of time here. Why, why isn't backprop biologically plausible? Because I think it should be said, even though I think backprop in some sense has something to tell us about the brain, um, obviously in, its, in just like the purest form, I think it's not running in the brain. I mean, that's kind of clear, and there's a bunch of reasons. So here's a, just a, a two-layer network. Um, and you know, we, we uh, take the derivatives of some error with, uh, in, the, in this case, we end up, you know, we just take, use the chain rule, get this expression at the end. Um, and this kind of summarizes, I think, why people have complained about backprop, and rightly so. So there's various things here. So it says um, the weights in the lower layer ought to be changed according to this expression. That expression involves an error term. Uh, it involves using the downstream weight matrices. Um, it involves using the derivative of the local activation function. Um, the last one is pretty easy. That's just the, the, the presynaptic input to that hidden layer. Um, and as well, it also backprop really involves the separate forward and backward passes. 
uh, which isn't really in that equation, but you, know, you need to do these two things. You need to do a forward pass, and then you need to do a backward pass. Um, and there's lots of things, okay, so there's lots of things to say about uh, these pieces, and I'm just gonna say a few of them and then hit more of them as I, as I go along. The error term was really a huge worry for people for ages. Um, I, 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 guess, I guess I kinda wanna say here, uh, when backprop kind of arrived on the scene, people were using it in a supervised setting, but I think now it's kind of clear that um, you can have an error term arriving uh, from reconstruction losses that are uh, from your unsupervised, your unsupervised algorithm. You can have, instead of just a normal error term in a supervised setting, you can have a policy gradient that shows up in a similar, in a similar sense, so when you're doing reinforcement learning. Um, so I think that that, that that sense that the error term is like a big boogeyman is, I think it's sort of uh, dying. Um, the second one, the transpose of the, the downstream weight matrices, um, that, I mean, I think that's still very real. I mean, it's not like, I think no one thinks that, uh, that, this, that this is a reasonable thing for the brain to have hold of um, and to use in, in earlier layers. Um, that is like real perfect transposes of downstream weights. The derivative of the activation function, I don't think is that big a deal. I mean, this thing is sort of basically a simple function of the input to those neurons. It's, I don't think it's that hard to imagine computing something like this if you wanted to. Um, but then the other one, the separate forward and backward passes is also probably pretty, um, pretty out there in some sense. Um, so that is that you would actually do sort of a forward prop through your network and then compute a back prop uh, quite separately and then use that to do updates. Um, right, so that's, that's usually the kind of uh, set, the, 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 at least some set of the things that people worry about when they worry about is backprop uh, or something like it operating in the brain. <coughs> um, but I wanna, yeah, I do wanna dig into these a little bit more, um, but I'm gonna start by s sort of mentioning, you know, there's been some recent indirect evidence, and this has been noted, I think, by a couple people here, um, coming from the, the DiCarlo lab and from Krieges Kortz lab, um, uh, sorry if I, I'm butchering those names, um, that are showing that, look, if we take big networks and we train them with backprop and we post hoc look into the representations, um, and we post hoc look into the representations, uh, these things that, uh, this thing doesn't work, that's okay. These, these, uh, these things that are trained and do better in terms of say classifying images, um, do, better at, uh, do better at letting you sort of um, l predict the variance in uh, V4 and IT neurons. And you see that that's even uh, better in the case of higher, higher level neurons in these, in these kind of convolutional networks. But that's pretty indirect, right? I mean, it doesn't say, that says that the, some of the representations formed look a bit like what you get in a backprop network, um, but it doesn't tell you how you got there. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm a bit obsessed about, is how, how do you get a big deep network that does uh, powerful things, like be able to operate on ImageNet, how did it get to that state? Okay, so I think it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty important in some sense to have this kind of a picture in mind, which is that there is, a, there is really a huge spectrum, I think, of credit assignment, um, credit assignment algorithms that might be working in a deep network that has a bunch of connections through. And on one side, in some sense, I would say, okay, you have something like backprop where you compute exactly the gradients and you make exactly these kinds of weight updates to all the, uh, to all the weights in your network and you do that well. Um, and and you, know, you sort of do it precisely. You, you give yourself precise knowledge of all the downstream connections. On the other far end, you have something along the lines of uh, weight perturbation or activity perturbation, which are simple reinforced style learning algorithms, which basically say, I'm gonna take, uh, so the E here, or the sort of something about a performance metric, an error or a performance metric. I'm gonna look at how my performance metric changes as a function of, say, noise that I inject um, into my weights or into my activities, and I'm gonna look at correlations between those things, and then I'm gonna make weight updates based on those correlations. So it's kind of the simplest thing you could do, and it's a great, it's a great idea in many ways, um, and in certain settings it works okay. Um, it should be said that I think there's been a sense, at least historically in neuroscience, that this kind of learning, this kind of correlation with a global, uh, global signal of change in performance um, has been, ha is what drives a lot of the learning in the brain. And I think there's good reasons for that, um, the good reasons to have thought that. For example, you do see things like dopamine delivered globally in the brain, or fairly globally in the brain, um, and that looks a bit like you transmitted something like uh, a performance, a global performance indicator. Um, 
Right. But what's what's troubling? What's what's trouble with the, the this sort of left side of the spectrum? is that it doesn't actually work very well in practice when you train on large networks with hard tasks. And notably, I think, as far as I'm aware, no one has used these kinds of techniques ever to be able to sort of successfully train um, a, a large network on something like ImageNet. It's, it just really, I think, probably does not work. In my hands, anyway, even smaller scale things than that really don't work. Um, and, and the reason is very simple. Um, the reason is very simple. As you increase the number of neurons in the, in, in the network, as you increase the number of weights, those correlations um, mean that those, those, the, the fact that you're sort of just doing this via correlations, um, you know, those weight updates, means that the variance on your gradient estimator gets worse and worse and worse as the number of neurons blows up. Um, so there are things in between, and that's what I'm going to talk a bit about today. Um, is you know what 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 lies in between this space, and I think what lies in between this space is tons and tons of algorithms that we haven't really explored all that well that know something about the downstream structure, um, that approximate something about the downstream structure, and use that to make weight updates that are much better than at that end, but maybe not quite backprop. Yeah. So, so looking on the left side of this, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what what do we know al al already, right? So in the real in the real brain, we understand that we, we know that. Say dopamine is not secreted everywhere. I mean, there are projections yes. in certain areas. Uh, yeah. There is temporal structure to that as well. <coughs> right. And so I, I just wonder, have there been attempts of trying to salvage something like this on the left side with maybe being somewhat more realistic in terms of spatial temporal dynamics? Sure. Right? Sure. So that's a good question. And I think the short answer is not nearly enough. And I wish people, more people would, because I think we need to, we need to understand this whole spectrum uh, better. As I said, in my hands, even on something like medium-sized data sets, the left-hand side, things like this, trying to salvage something like the left-hand side has been really hard. Like even after two or three layers of neurons and things like this, I can't even get things to take off reasonably using that sort of those sort of approaches. Doesn't mean it can't be done. I mean, if we've learned anything recently, it's that negatives, you know, don't mean a whole lot. So please, I mean, my 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 failure on that case, you know, I, I would it would be great to see more people try and see if they could. Um, in fact, so I'll, I'll say a little bit, uh, very very briefly about this um, um, more, which is so here's here's sort of learning on MNIST. Um, these are. This is. Uh, this is just. This is just MNIST. Here's um, backprop in the blues with varying uh, numbers of neurons in it, with a couple layers in uh, hidden layers. Um, the others are node perturbation and weight perturbation, where you're. Uh, yeah, you same structure network, and you're sort of seeing you're doing all the weight updates using weight perturbation, node perturbation, and even on MNIST, these are reasonably well tuned as we as far as we can tell. And even on MNIST, this is insanely slow to sort of to learn these things. Um, and in harder in harder data sets, we feel like I, I haven't even been able to get these things to take off uh, reasonably at all. Um, we don't understand necessarily why that is, but it's uh, theoretically in some limit these things should work. Um, but, but it's sort of what is that limit in terms of number of samples and number of data trials. Um, on the other hand, we have things like target prop uh, variants, which I'll talk a bit about more, which, um, which can do a pretty good job. So these are uh, MNIST and one of the medium-sized data sets I talked about, um, Street View House Numbers, um, where they do about as well as backprop, and on, on these data sets anyway, um, abound as well as backprop and abound as quickly. So there are other algorithms out there um, which don't make some of the assumptions that backprop does that do decently, and I'll, I'll kind of dig into that a bit more as I go. Okay, so I want to I want to say that uh, this is also sort of maybe back to this point. I mean, I think that there was a good reason for a neuro neuroscientist all along to believe that something like backprop uh, is going on. Um, and, and like I said, to, for a machine learner, an appeal to the variance in gradient estimators is often enough. You can kind of just sort of spell that out to them, and they're, they're pretty happy. Um, but it's rarely enough to convince neuroscientists. Um, and, and so I kind of, um, I think that first of all, I want to say, what do I mean by something like backprop? And this is what I mean. And it's that learning is achieved across multiple layers by sending information from neurons, so detailed information from neurons closer to the output, output back to earlier layers to help compute their synaptic updates. Um, and that, that's kind of what I mean by something like backprop. And I think, you know, um, if we think about that, uh, if you kind of believe in some very basic things um, that we, we, I think we just know about cortex, uh, 
then you're, you should be almost on the same page already that, that that's going on in the brain. And the specific form of it, we have very little idea, but the generalities we, we know, and that is because feedback connection in cortex are ubiquitous. They're really all over the place. That is from area back to earlier air areas. And they, they, those connections, people have shown, modify the activity and spiking in neurons in earlier layers. And the second thing is that um, plasticity in the forward connections can be driven by pre- and post-synaptic spiking, e.g. E sort of like uh, STDP protocols. And so if you just put those together, the feedback connections are gonna modify the spike times uh, of these guys, which means that you're going to change how the, the forward connections are being learned. So almost, almost, um, uh, almost sort of just by, by simple derivation, the, the something like backprop is going on. Um, now the specifics, as I said, have all to be sort of worked out. <clears throat> and you could still claim that those modifications are kind of epiphenomenal and don't, uh, aren't doing anything interesting. But it, seems, it would seem like a little crazy to me. Um, you know, why have all those feedback connections? And why have them do things like modify learning in earlier layers? Okay. I also want to kind of hit, as I said, again, this point about reinforcement learning. I mean, it's clear that the brain is making massive use of reinforcement learning, and I think it's good to have a clear view of how, how, how sort of backprop-like things and reinforcement learning might be fitting together um, and, and what that means and to sort of um, make sure we're teasing those apart nicely and have it clear in our heads. So here's the sort of standard reinforcement learning block diagram where you've got an agent, say, composed of a bunch of networks. Um, that's getting observations and rewards and sending actions to an environment. And, and what, we've, what, we have, what, what people have been doing a, a lot recently, what I've been spending a lot of my time doing, is sort of doing RL with big, big networks. And I think it's worth just sort of looking, walking through that a tiny bit to see how we think about now that hooks up with something like Backprop. And so here's a single tri trial of reinforcement learning, right? You know, you start in some state, you run through some policy network, you produce an action, you sample from that policy network, you produce an action, get a reward, transition to a new state, and so on through time. You know, you've got a trajectory here, and you can, if you wanted, compute uh, the probability of a trajectory in this, in this way. And if you do a bit of, uh, if you do a bit of math, um, uh, well, so, so actually before I get there, so, you know, what do we do as far as, uh, Outcomes, you know, we would do something like compute the return for a single trial, which is some discounted sum of rewards. And then our objective function is like, you know, what you really care about is integrating over all the possible trajectories you, you, your policy would take you to, what are the returns associated with those trajectories? And integrating that over all the trajectories you might reach, um, you know. Okay, so then what, we, what people are, are, are doing a lot now um, in RL in, with, with deep networks is something like this. It's to use a model-free policy gradient setup, which in some sense bears a lot of resemblance to what I talked about earlier, this sort of simple way of updating weights. Um, and you would roll out a trajectory, see what happens, compute, um, you know, compute performance metrics and all this, um, but then basically just take, uh, take the derivative, in some sense, uh, a sample derivative of your um, of your objective function. And this is, I suppose, the really important part. Um, you, that, 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 that kind of splits into two parts where you kind of do the RL part in these reduced actions, uh, action, space, um, uh, action spaces. And then you still, at the end of the day, take the derivatives back through your big deep network. And if you weren't doing that, you'd be in a lot of trouble um, to learn the, sorts of, learn the sorts of complicated behaviors we can now learn. So this is an agent that's gotten raw pixels and rewards and, and learns to go around and collect uh, objects in an environment and learns to do it relatively successfully. So the basic agent would just like run into the walls and all these kinds of things. And, and this is kind of almost, it is basically almost becoming old hat, but I think it's worth dwelling here on, on the, you know, what, what are the relationships between reinforcement learning and, and algorithms like Backprop? And the relationship ex exactly is that we use a bunch of RL, but we are combining it with Backprop, and, and that's really crucial. So this still takes hundreds of millions of steps, even with Backprop. So if you were instead sitting there and doing the sort of updates to your weights, you know, you got a policy gradient up at the top, and then from that point on, you did correlative-based um, updates to the weights in your network without taking into account the structure of the network. This hundreds of millions would get basically intractably worse, right? Intractably worse. So we basically just, I think it would just probably would not work. 
I'm happy to have people prove me wrong, but that's, that's my, 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 my sense of things at the moment. Okay, so now having, having I, I think that there's a similar story to tell for unsupervised learning. Again, that like all the, the, all the sort of stuff that we're doing recently, there's some cool stuff talked about with uh, prednets and so on that were, were, was discussed yesterday. All these things I think have basically used um, backprop um, and, and so some sort of replacement for it is worth, worth looking for. Uh, that's pretty loud. Okay, so I'm gonna go back a bit to uh, this question and, and talk a bit about some actual attempted replacements and some, some ideas from uh, the recent neuroscience literature. So yeah, again, why isn't backprop biologically plausible? These are some of the reasons. One of the things that I got interested in particularly in part because it was one of the big things that people sort of were worried about is this transpose of downstream weights. So knowing about your own internal structure. Um, so, right, and, and uh, this, is, this was actually coined uh, historically, this was coined the weight transport problem, um, I think in 87 in a paper by uh, Grossberg. So the, in 1986, Backprop was published, 1987, uh, Grossberg published a paper and talked about some of the issues with thinking about backprop as, as, as saying anything about the brain. And one of the issues he pointed out was this issue of needing to know about W1 in order to update W0. Um, and he coined this the weight transport problem. And if in the literature through the 80s and 90s, it was probably one of the biggest cited issues with backprop. So, um, you know, why do you need to do this? Uh, why, do, why do you need to do this? This is the sort of basic figure. I mean, backprop sends. Uh, sends error back precisely through symmetric sets of synapses. And this, I think everyone would generally agree in neuroscience looks crazy, um, having sort of these precise set of synapses in that backward error path, as in your forward path uh, forward. Um, now, uh, I think surprisingly, um, so I, I did some work playing around with thinking about whether you could learn backward weights. So you say forget about trying to, forget about trying to sort of like use the tr that transpose, could you actually learn these backward weights? Um, and in the process during uh, control experiments, actually stumbled on something even weirder, which was that for a lot of problems, even if you just took a, a backward uh, weight matrix B, you just sampled it randomly and then froze it, actually things work remarkably well. So this, this figure is basically showing a very, very simple problem, but um, uh, the, the upper lines are sort of some shallow learning, reinforcement learning um, along the lines of node perturbation that I talked about. Um, the black line is backprop, and this green line is what I'd called feedback alignment, where you just fix those backward weights to some random set, um, and you just did learning as usual otherwise. And essentially you see this thing tracks backprop uh, really pretty well on this problem. This is showing that actually over time, uh, there's there, the, the sorts of updates that feedback alignment was making come to close, more closely resemble those of backprop. And you don't have to have them come, uh, so zero would be if they were exactly what backprop was doing, and they don't have to be perfect in order to get, you can see, you don't have to be perfect in order to get learning that looks very much like backprop. So that's part of the, I think part of the idea here is that you don't have to know perfectly about your down, the downstream structure of the network that you're dealing with. You should maybe just have some idea about it, um, and that, that might work. Now here it looks like you have no idea about it, because B is just totally, yep. So is in that case actually W learning about B? I mean, I That's a great question. And, and, and in fact, empirically, yes it is. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So uh, just very quickly, this also works for uh, things like MNIST and some harder data sets. Um, and I'll get, I'll come to sort of like, you know, where, where we really stand now, but this is sort of MNIST and you can see the green is performing about as well as backprop. Um, and you see so, sort of similar dynamics in this, in terms of this, what do the weight updates look like? Do they look like um, what backprop is doing? Yep. Can you clarify, so, so WT was used for training. There's no feedback projections, right? So W... Random case, you do have feedback projections? So in both cases, there's feedback projections. In the backprop case, that's the sort of normal backprop case, you use exactly the transpose of W, which, all, which changes as W changes, of course. Um, in this case... I mean, for purely feedback network. Yes. You still use backprop. Okay? That's right. In absence of actual feedback projections. That's right. So the feedback so connections are only used during training. Use but that's right. They're only used. They're only used during learning. That's right. But in, in, the, in the other case, 
do you have or you don't have? Uh, in this case, they're only used for learning as well. That's right. And I, and I think it should be said, that is one of the other things that I think is, I, I mean, it wasn't listed on my slide, but it's one of the other issues that is clearly objectionable about backprop. We know that the feedback connections in cortex actually alter activity in earlier layers, whereas the feedback connections in backprop really are only there for learning. You can literally throw them away. They're like, you know, I, I, but I think that these things uh, can live together. And I, I'll talk a bit, of, a bit more about that. Um, so in any case, so, so yeah, B is this unstructured thing that's just sampled at the beginning of learning and fixed. Um, yep, sorry. Yes. Why does it work only in cases where it waits for mess at the beginning? Yes, that is true. Also, it seems like uh, feedback connectors don't do that much, right? When they're silenced, and you have a hard time seeing what their effect is. So yes. Well, and that's right. So I would say, my, 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 I, don't think, I don't think that they're just for learning, but I think, um, I mean, there's been some like uh, talk about this yesterday. My guess would be that they're mostly for learning and that the, the kind of the, uh, just to wax a little bit, that they're probably um, sort of to n do, nudge you in the right direction for, for inference. So you sort of say, okay, you should move in this direction. And then having moved in that direction a bit, you look at those deltas and those deltas inference wise tell you, oh, you know, you should do that more, more in future. Instead of having to compute it via the feedback, you know, the forward connection should just do that in future. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know when to ask this question, but the, are, the synaptic weights that you're talking about, if you actually look at a synapse, they're very low resolution things. They might have 10 or 15 AMPA channels in them yep. that can be modified. So are we, are, have you, quantified or will you comment later on the ability for this entire scheme to work when you have very low resolution weights for learning, yep. including in your scheme, if you were going to assume back, uh, backwardly directed weights, they would also be yep. equally poor quality yep. weights. Yep. And so I'm saying, is, is this a non, is, does this kill things or is it perfect? So, so it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, I think, like loosely, I think it doesn't. There's been a bunch of work in machine learning recently um, specifically around, so first of all, definitely around trying to have fewer bits, you know, in your in your representation of weights. Um, and in fact, there's a whole little sub community who care not at all about neuroscience, but love the idea of getting rid of tons and tons of bits, both in the activations and in the weights, because they want to run things on your cell phone. <laughs> so, so there is a community who is doing that, who's understanding, um, you know. Uh, who's trying to understand when I want to train those kinds of networks, um, can I do it uh, with very few bits? And the answer is, look, I, I think the, an the short answer is, yeah, roughly, and people are making progress on it. It's certainly not solved in the sense that you can get exactly the kinds of performance you can with like 32-bit floating stuff everywhere. But people are making reasonably good progress on it in that, in that niche. Um, yeah. Um, OK. Uh, so, so very quickly. Um, one of the things that we actually see happening, someone asked this question, was that when you go and look at the, the weights, W, uh, they, actually do, they actually do sort of align. So if we look at all the synapses blue, this is sort of some, we're looking at some sort of alignment between the backward weights and the forward weights. And they are, the, the, this over the progress, process of training is, is getting uh, closer. And B is fixed, so this must be happening in W. And indeed, this is kind of what we believe is going on in this, in this kind of weird situation, which is that there's, uh, there's first of all, some transfer of information about the content of B into uh, W naught by updates. Then uh, W naught actually, that, that, information, that information about B actually gets transferred up into W. Once you've had that happen, there is this uh, course, a, a correspondence formed between uh, W and B. And then in the third phase, then, actually you can have reasonably uh, decent learning happen and um, you know, deep learning happen. That is, the, the error transmitted via B is effective for W naught. And I think, I mean, it's really worth saying, I think that um, the, it's really worth not overstating uh, the importance of this in the sort of trying to figure out what's going on in Cortex. It's more that I think this was an illustration that there's gonna be a lot of learning algorithms, ones that even surprise us a lot, uh, where you can know very roughly about your downstream weights, and that's good enough to do much, much better learning than simple uh, RL reinforced style things. Yep. Sorry. I, I'm Sorry. Trying.
contract is the, the number of feedback signals here is still <coughs> basically the same as the number of W's, give or take, right? Yeah. Uh, so we still have one, reinfor one feedback signal per one synapse uh, in, this, in this setup. One feedback signal, say, per neuron in the hidden layer, sorry. And I think, I mean, the, probably the biggest distinction, right, between something like a standard reinforce um, style algorithm and what you would do in backprop is you deliver in backprop uh, vector-based error to all of your um, neurons, which is really sort of computed and individualized for those guys. And you use detailed feedback to do that. And that's, those are the things that I think are important rather than just a global uh, scalar delivery. Was there another question? I assume it's more realistic to change B once in a while, right? There should be a drift in B. Have you tried that? To sure. So there's lots of things. Again, I mean, there's a whole bunch. And actually, I'll, maybe I'll get on to some of these uh, other ones where you would maybe choose train B and, and so on in a moment. Uh, other people have is the short answer. Yeah. Um, OK. So I also want to just comment very briefly on some of the energy-based model stuff, which was talked about yesterday. And I, I suspect that this stuff has a lot in the end to tell us about uh, things. People, I think, have liked in the literature around backprop, have liked energy-based stuff because you don't have this weird uh, forward phase and then backward phase that are completely disjoint. What you do is something like this. You have a, a, a network which is full of recurrent units. Um, you run a positive phase where you clamp, uh, uh, you clamp these, uh, you clamp some say data and target uh, to the network. You t and you you let this thing evolve till. Um, until it's, it's done in some sense. You have what's called the negative phase where you'd say just clamp the data and let the whole thing run and say output its own, uh, its own target. And importantly, when you do this, the, the way that you update the hidden units is you integrate stuff from uh, the, the forward connections and things from the backward connections. And it's really the difference between these phases that's used to drive learning. So the, the weight updates are, are a, function of, uh, a function of looking across these phases. At the moment, empirically, these, are, are, these, these uh, algorithms are a bit problematic, basically because you need fairly long settling phases that look a little bit crazy. Um, but I think people are hopeful that maybe some of that can be dealt with. Um, so I, I actually think there's probably insight to be had in the energy-based model direction. Um, empirically, it's sort of it's been hard to make them work at scale, in part because of these long settling times, especially if you have many layers of neurons. But it, it's, it's worth p putting them into this uh, roadmap. Um, one of the things that I, I've been more interested in recently um, is, is just this question. And is it, th that is that do any of the existing biologically motivated learning algorithms scale up to solve really hard credit assignment problems? Um, and, and I think uh, what I'm going to show you, a spoiler, is that, like a bit of a negative. Um, we don't have much. Um, and I think that's interesting in its own right. Then there's a lot more work to do there. So I'm going to talk about one specific bit of work we did with an algorithm called uh, difference target prop and variants of it, uh, which we took as kind of, uh, I thought, maybe one of the nicest starting points to investigate that question. Um, and basically, we took it because it, it, did a, it satisfied a couple things. Um, it said, OK, it does get rid of weight transport almost. And we have a variant of it where we did get rid of weight transport entirely. Um, and we also tried it in the context where we didn't do any weight tying, as in for the convolutions. Um, and we also wanted to try and get rid of uh, signed error signals, which I think is one of the issues in backprop, or you can certainly point to and say, you know, look, it doesn't really look like what we're transmitting back through feedback connections are signed, signed errors. I should say that when we did these experiments, we still have all of these issues. We're still using continuous rather than spiking signals. We still violate Dale's law. We still do use separate and forward and backward passes um, and local activity derivatives and your personal complaint here. But in some ways, I think the, 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 uh, our, our, part of our impetus recently has been like, look, do we have any algorithms on the table which, uh, for the really well-known constraints, can do anything decent on big problems? <coughs> Um, so, OK, so here's the algorithm. Here's the sort of starting point for these, this class of algorithms, which is target propagation. And this goes back to an algorithm, uh, uh, the, an idea, a set of ideas from Jan um, in the, the 80s. And the idea is very simple and, and kind of nice. And I think actually agrees with a lot of the ideas that people have talked about here, um, which, is, which is this. You do some forward pass through some network. Um, and then to begin with, let's assume you have perfect inverses for those layers. So then you can take a target up at the top, 
and basically project it through these inverses and say, well, if I wanted to get that target as an output, um, what should have my activity been here in these layers in order to pr perfectly produce that target at the output? So these you can think about as basically top-down expectations. So it's sort of, I got this inverse, I compute down through it, you should have been this. Um, and then just layer-wise, I do a simple difference between, uh, between these things, and I update uh, the weights so that I would have landed closer to this thing um, in future if I saw that pattern. Right? So in some sense, it's like dead simple, and it's kind of lovely. It's, it's, it's using top-down expectations, uh, it, et cetera. It's transporting across layers, not errors, but uh, activities. So that's what it's sending across layers, is expectations about what the lower layer should have been. In practice, this algorithm doesn't really work very well, unfortunately. Um, and so there was a, uh, a fellow in Yoshua Benjo's lab uh, called uh, Dong Hyun, who, who worked on this idea called difference target prop. And it's, uh, I think the details are maybe, the details are maybe not uh, too worth going, on to, uh, going into here. But the main uh, notion was, okay, it's, it's obviously unrealistic to have these perfect inverses. So what, what, what he did was he said, I'm gonna learn imperfect inverses uh, going back through the layers, just using an autoencoder uh, reconstruction loss. So I'm gonna try and reconstruct what was sent up from here up and then down. So I'm gonna learn these imperfect inverses and I'm gonna use those imperfect inverses uh, to send, so first of all, to send uh, targets, just as, as I did in the last, uh, the last slide. Um, but I can also use the reconstruction here as a way to correct those targets and make them better, um, and make them better. And this algorithm does nominally work reasonably well for s at least small and mid-sized mid problems. Um, and also to the point maybe back there, it explicitly says, yeah, maybe we should learn the backward weights. And so they, they, um, you do updates on the backward weights V here. Um, so you have <coughs> basically layer-wise uh, layer losses, layer-wise learning rules that operate at every layer, um, and you have them both for the forward and backward weights. Right, now this, in practice, the actual version that they wrote about uh, still used backprop at the very top level. Um, we worked on a variant where we sort of got rid of the gradient completely at that top level. I don't think it's too germane here, but we, we looked at this a bit. And then we looked at a bunch of data sets running from MNIST all the way up to ImageNet, <clears throat> and we looked at fully connected and locally connected uh, networks. And by locally connected, I mean not ComNets, but where, where you do weight sharing, but you actually get rid of that. Um, and kind of saw, and, and, and sought to see how well these things would work in practice. So here is the rough story which is that on MNIST, you can kind of do pretty well with this, this kind of thing. Um, and and, and do get replicate original results, get good accuracy, um, great. In Street View House number, and sort of going on down, uh, the story is that the gap uh, between difference target prop and our variants of it uh, widened a bit, so that by the time you get down to CIFAR, and you're working with locally connected uh, architectures in CIFAR, um, there actually ends up being pretty large gaps, uh, pretty large gaps in performance. Um, and basically this is because uh, difference target prop is producing approximations to those gradients and there's some variance to those estimators and probably even some bias to those estimators, which might be even worse, um, that produce these suboptimal learning results. You can kind of see this very uh, briefly here. Maybe it's just best to look at the learning curves um, <clears throat> where these guys are, these guys here, our variants of our, our, our backprop in these architectures, um, and the other ones up there are uh, the other guys up there um, in these bands, if you like, are uh, variants of, of, of target prop. Um, okay, so the real one for us though was you know, these things were still kind of working reasonably well. The real thing we wanted to look at was scaling this all the way up to ImageNet, which is, we, which is something that we know humans can do reasonably well, and, and so we're like, you know. This was, I should, I should mention, the, the, the result here is obviously pretty negative, but I thought this was the best one we had on the table in some sense, right? So I think it wasn't, I, I actually think Dong, Dong Hyun did some great work, and it, this was kind of like, I was excited, this was like the best thing on the table um, that didn't violate uh, weight transport and so on. Anyway, this is the basic result. Um, backprop, uh, backprop in this kind of, I should say these results are not particularly good for ImageNet, but this is a relatively small network that we're training this on for various reasons I can get into. Um, 
Uh, but the, the, the important thing is the different target prop and all the variants we explored are up there in that little band. So they can barely, they basically can't even get, get off the ground in these relatively small networks, five to seven layers of, of locally connected units and so on. So they're, they're really just not uh, doing well on this. Um, and the, the short story there is I think we need to be looking for other algorithms that sit somewhere in that spectrum, uh, in the middle ground of that spe spectrum. Um, okay, so I think that was a bit of a negative story. I want to tell a bit more of a positive story coming from the, the neuroscience front, which is, you know, we've learned a lot more about uh, neurons, and people made reference to the, the, point, the point neuron stuff, and I, I completely agree. I think we've been trapped when we've been trying to think about and dream about, imagine new algorithms that might be operating in the brain. We've really been trapped by thinking about point uh, neurons, and this is one of the big reasons, I think, if you think that things are point neurons in cortex, then you think that when feedback, feed forward activity and feedback activity arrives into a neuron, basically those voltages just get totally mixed together and the neuron has no idea which is which, right? It's like, what is feedback and what is feed forward? I mean, there's no, there's, there's no discriminating. It's all just voltage, it just gets mushed into my, um, you know, into my soma and uh, that, I, that I think is a big, that has really held us back. Nowadays, coming from, you know, coming from the neuroscience side, we have a much, a much richer, much more interesting picture of, of what neurons, in especially in cortex, uh, do and, and, and might be doing. And so we think, for example, that there really is strong electrotonic uh, segregation in some of these neurons, where feed forward activity is arriving into a very different compartment, say, from feedback activity from other areas in cortex. Um, and that <clears throat> not only that, not only is there compartmentalization, but the communications between, say, the basal and the apical, uh, the basal apical de uh, depart uh, compartments of these things, those communications are, are interesting and rich and sparse and dictated by various mechanisms. So you have BAPs going back up, uh, you have calcium spikes that come down, and there's lots of dynamics that sort of surround that, and you have interneurons which synapse onto some of these proximal things that can additionally control the communication between these compartments. So not only are they communicating, but you actually have control. And I think the picture that this is summoning for me is you can start to dream up uh, and think about algorithms where the forward pass and the backward pass really is semi-separable. So you have some semi-separability between these things, and you even have possibly control over how those forward and backward passes talk to each other. So there's some very cool work uh, by Urbenzik and Sen who th were thinking about this not in a deep learning scenario, but were thinking about multi-compartment uh, neurons and learning. And one of the things that they pointed out in this cool paper in Neuron was that they could actually take this multi-compartment neuron, think about doing the error computations internal to a cell rather than trying to think about having error shipped around. Um, and that by doing that, actually things could be made much sort of nicer with respect to how you think about the biology. Um, and so here they're getting the cell to sort of track some, uh, track some signal over time. Um, but you could do it in this multi-compartment way in, you know, where, whereas if you tried to do this with point neurons, it would look hopeless and it would look like terribly biologically implausible. Um, so we spent a bit of time uh, with some collaborators with Jordan and with uh, Blake Richards um, thinking about how you could integrate those ideas into um, deep, learning, uh, deep learning style algorithms. Um, and the, the, the sort of short version is we're thinking about how to sort of ship information back from higher layers to uh, den sort of the apical dendrites in lower layers. Um, and in, we can get these things to kind of nominally work in sort of fully spiking networks with uh, multi-compartment multi -compartment neurons. Um, I should say, that I really, it really ought to be said, especially on, uh, after the last stuff that I talked about, getting this stuff to work in spiking networks is still hard. Um, it still it doesn't perform as well as we would if we did it in non-spiking networks. So there's a whole variety of, uh, of issues, I think, to sort out there. Um, yep? So to learn, all you need is to get you need to get air signal to the, to the soma. Yep. You have to do sort of pre-filtering, right? Sure. But you don't need dendrites for that. So, I mean, sure. the bear's going to ask that question, because I know this paper inside and out. But what 
What do you really need to upgrade to? Or is it so here's here's my uh, here's my I, I think my my honest sort of uh, take on this is that what we didn't really do much of in this paper, and I think where we would have to head is really that question the question that I or the the idea that I mentioned a bit earlier that you really want forward and backward passes to be going on roughly simultaneously, and that in order to do that, dendrites might be a real help. Be because of like, if you have a single compartment into which everything arrives simultaneously, how can you help but basically, you know, have to separate your forward and backward passes? But in this case, you didn't have separate forward and backward passes. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a conversation to have here. Maybe we can take. Yeah, I think I'm running up on time, but it, it was worth uh, asking. So I'll just. I, I think that that was. I mean, I think there really is a bit of a positive side of the story here, which is that neuroscience is telling us all sorts of things, complexifying what cortex looks like, what the the, the cells look like, what the circuits look like. Um, and so I think there's two real interesting directions to my mind. Um, one is uh, one is on the neuros the sort of machine learning front, which is look. If we write down a couple more constraints, like weight tying and a, a few of these, I think like low bits in terms of the backward pass weights, I think is a real is a real one as well. Um, do we have? Can we find any algorithms that will learn to do really hard problems, right? Like like ImageNet. And I think that there is still work to do there. I mean, as far as I know, we just don't have those algorithms. Um, and on the neuroscience front, we, I think we should step up and start explicitly looking to identify the role of feedback in weight updates. So I think some, even the, some of the simplest experiments you could dream up where you would say establish a, pro, uh, a plasticity protocol in sort of forward weights and then mess around with uh, the feedback coming into neurons and, and look at how that changes the plasticity protocol in those forward going weights. Um, those experiments, I think, in the past have probably not been easy to do, but we have the tools to do it now, and we probably should look into those kinds of things uh, directly and explicitly. Um, and I think I'll probably uh, kind of wrap up there and take questions and um, see how things go. Yeah, I think that was the first one, sorry. Can, I, can you go back to the picture of your picture there? It, it's worth keeping in mind. <coughs> The evidence over the last several years has been that there's a scale that, of spatial scale in which it's very important for plus, synaptic plasticity, which is very sub-neuron and sort of dendrite level. And even <coughs> in, in, during development and during some kinds of learning protocols, there's a scale of like 10 microns within, within a dendrite where, the synaptic plasti where, where synapses influence each other in terms of you know, potentiation and so on. But certainly dendrite level because there are proteins which go up, you know, with, Dendrite branch sure. So, if you were going to have, if that's true, um, then you need. It seems like the feedback can't just be cell wide, as you're depicting here. You would need to instruct synapses on a much finer spatial scale. You, you might. We, you might need to. I mean, I think, as far as I'm concerned, there's just you might need to, and I, I would certainly wouldn't say no. I think that there's just a lot of open questions here. I mean, maybe you don't to get decent enough learning. I think, I think that's where the, 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 the sort of the, the question falls down is uh, maybe, maybe those feedback and signals can be roughly cells, like cell specific and that's enough. I mean at the moment even convincing people that they should really be cell specific and that, 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 that cell specific feedback would carry information about the downstream structure of the brain. I, mean, that, that would be, I would be happy if people were on board with that. I think you're talking about like even another level which would be great but yeah. On the, the tasks you described uh, are all, uh, in essence, static tasks. Yeah. So, uh, Absolutely. Let me, I, 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 hopefully I can preempt this. The only reason, I mean, I'd like, of course we should do things like uh, the, the things that were talked about yesterday, like these prednets and so on. Of course the brain is, is really, I think, built around doing temporal things. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, and, and of course we should like, look at these things in, in, in temporal tasks. I have looked at and thought about this stuff a lot in the, the atemporal case, basically for ease. I, I think that it's not like things get much easier when you go to temporal. Now, some of the ideas about how you construct the algorithms might get easier. For example, I mean, if you have, um, if, you, if you took an algorithm like this, uh, like difference target prop, uh, and, and you thought about, you know, if you thought about what's needed here, 
um, in the atemporal case, you need to still kind of do a forward pass and a backward pass, right? Full ones in order to work on that specific temp like that specific static image. If you're doing this in time, right, then maybe it suffices to kind of do these relatively local loops, and you're doing this sort of temporally and making predictions about the lower layer, the lower layer, kind of at a, at a you know uh, in a temporal in a temporal fashion, which doesn't require full backward and, and fo forward and backward passes. There's a much harder problem because the, the original sense of credit assignment problem is <coughs> trying to correct an error that was done a minute ago. Ah, okay, so I, spike I, I, okay, wrong. absolutely. So there's another, there's a whole other uh, kettle of fish around like temporal credit assignment and I absolutely wouldn't deny that. I guess I'm saying that you, this is kind of, uh, uh, if you like, uh, an easy benchmark and we're not even hitting that. So you're saying, like, look, th th you have a problem like this, but we also, on top of that, have these temporal credit assignment issues, and I completely agree, and I'm saying we can't even solve the static ones. And we don't, we're not even, I think we're not even a place where we have sort of sufficiently been able to address how you would uh, do this in the static case. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for a great talk. I, I, and I, um, what I'm trying to understand, that's what you wrap my mind around is, you start with the statements that, that the uh, just a single backwards, uh, single, single, single feedback signal is not good enough, right? Um, and so, uh, on the other hand, there is backpropagation where you get a signal per neuron, roughly speaking, yeah. right? Yeah. And, but what you are doing here is you are still getting a signal per neuron. It's just that the signal is not exactly the backprop, it's correlated to backprop somehow, right? Uh, and so, maybe then this is I mean, if I were sort of to put a skeptic hat on, right, this is not surprising that if you have the same number of feedback signals as in backprop and they are correlated with it, then you would be able to do something good, right? Yeah. So can, we, can, can one take this I, arguments and sort of put them closer to the, to, 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 uh, to the left side where the, the number of feedback signals is much smaller than the number of neurons that you are trying to Sure, it might be. I mean, it might be, and I think there's, like as I said, that spectrum is relatively underexplored, uh, and it would be great to see more there. I mean, to me, uh, when, I look at the, when I look at Cortex, I do see a whole bunch of uh, single neuron-specific feedback from later areas, say, from, V1 to, like from V2 back to V1. So to me, it kind of looks like the machinery exists there to do relatively targeted, even single neuron feedback. Um, but it's absolutely possible, like, look, those things are, as I said, almost certainly approximations of, of knowing about your downstream structure. And uh, as you say, there might be sort of things closer to the left-hand side of that spectrum that work really well. And I think we don't know. Yes. Oh, one, one. Okay. <laughs> so this is from Gautam Ramachandra, and he asks, which is biologically plausible, the reinforcement learning or the use of spiking neural networks approach for the computational modeling of the brain? Um, which? Uh, can I say both? I mean, wait, I, I, yeah, I'm happy to say both there. Maybe if he's not here, then we'll have to, we'll have to live with that. Uh, yeah. I wonder whether you have also thought about the one, I think, fundamental question in the way how brains apparently learn, for example, the task of image net, you know, like really classifying visual objects. A, there seems to be really not genetically encoded. You no, know, you have face areas or so in brains, in particular, you no. Know, kind of parts of the tissue, and you also, you have a learning schedule, right, where you first learn simple tasks, and then you build on this you know, ramification. Yes. So this suggests that possibly it's unnecessary, or maybe this spectrum <coughs> only arises because you want to learn everything at once in the network. Yep. Rather than I, I, think, I, I think this is a great, that's right, I think this is a great um, worry Here's my, 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 my rough thinking about it, and I think it's one of these things where the questions are, are genuinely empirical, and we need to just do work and, and, and dig into these things. Um, to me, it's true that, yes, we have some Gabor-like things that uh, look pretty evident in V1 pretty early on, and then we have things like face areas which seem to have biases towards maybe face-like uh, um, things. But especially once you move, uh, actually quite quickly when you move through this, this structure, um, the number of bits dictating which neuron ought to do which and how it's sort of wired up and so on, there are, there are, there are just huge numbers of bits. 
um, in those networks, which I think are not there from genetics, just because there aren't that many bits, I think, conveyed um, by the genes in terms of how you should wire this neuron very explicitly to this neuron. Um, and so to my mind, that there, there's so many of those bits that even when you talk about, okay, there's a bit of a bias to having a face area and so on, you really, I think, are going to have to con confront um, the sort of general deep learning question. And another sign of that, I would say, is that even though we can point to Gabor-like patches and, and face areas and so on, the fact remains that a human can reach uh, incredible, uh, incredible skills at something like Go, which I think had, you know, w which really requires big deep networks to compute value functions and policy functions, I think, and, and for which, you know, uh, evolution had nothing to say about that. And, and I think that the, the, the sort of the synaptic weights, you know, priors over the synaptic weights um, really weren't helping you build that network. So that would kind of be my rough answer, but I, I see what you mean, what, what, you, what, what you mean. <clears throat> I think, was this, a, yeah, sorry, go for it, go for it. Um, I'm thinking about predictive coding in, in, in this spectrum that you presented. Um, what would you place predictive coding algorithms? Because in that case, you do have constant use of both the feed forward yep. and the feedback path. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, I mean, basically, I think you could imagine taking something very much like uh, uh, target prop-like ideas, which basically are trained with, uh, with auto-encoding losses here. Um, and you could imagine doing this kind of unrolled in time. And I think the kinds of algorithms you'd write down um, starting from that point and thinking about predictive coding, or, or if, if, sorry, if you extended this in time, um, the sort of algorithms you'd write down and play around with would look very much like the sort of predictive coding ballpark, uh, basically. Um, going back to the indirect evidence at the beginning of your talk, do you think that any of these modifications will impact the representational similarity uh, between uh, units in trained networks and brain? Or do you think there's just a common sort of representation to which all of these different modified algorithms are going to converge in? Uh, I see. Um, okay, right. And so that, that, that's, yeah, maybe back to that slide where I said, like, people have looked and they see sort of things that look vaguely like the networks that were trained by Backprop. Um, that is a good question, and I think, again, it's just one of these things that we don't know enough about. There's some evidence that the, the there is some evidence, I would say now, especially in deep networks where uh, maybe deep networks with multiple components to them and things like this, that the optimizer does matter in terms of the representations you end up with. Um, so there's some evidence for that. I think it basically, I think that's what you're talking about, right? And, and so you could even see roughly the same error and then the, the actual um, the result, the, the actual internal results you see look quite different. I mean, actually, there's a really good, I, I don't know if it's been published yet, but I think they've spoken about it at a couple conferences. I think maybe both from the DiCarlo lab and from uh, Krieges Court lab, where if you take big uh, ResNets instead of things that look more like AlexNet and VGG, if you take big ResNets and you train those on ImageNet, and then you do this post hoc analysis where you compare them to the brain, uh, those ResNets do actually a fair bit better on ImageNet, but the actual representations look a lot less um, like what you see in Monkey IT and V4. So, so I think there, the architecture, at least the architecture there has pulled, uh, has pulled the representations away from being similar. Uh, yep. So I have a question about the training regime, that the backup works in compared to the training team that the brain typically works in, right? Because like, in backup you get like IID samples, something that brains don't usually receive as data. So like, maybe there's a trained dichotomy difference between. Sure, there absolutely is. I mean, I think, I mean, we can talk about ideas like maybe, you know, people are using hippocampus to store stuff and do more IID-like sampling as you do with replay buffers and so on. But in general, sure. I would say, though, that that kind of only makes all these problems harder. And, and maybe that's a general comment, right? I think that, like, time has come up uh, several times, like this kind of thing. Um, the, the, I think by, I, I think, I'm not saying uh, absolutely that, that looking at the supervised case is like the thing to do. Obviously, there's all these other complexities. I guess I'm saying that you know it's good to start simple if and when you can, um, and maybe that'll just be, I mean, it will be insufficient at some point, but I think having answers even in that simple case would be a handle on things in that simple case is good. So I totally agree, but yeah. Um, so when you move the very top at point neuron, yep. what was the reason that you all of a sudden jumped into a compartmental model and a spike neuron? Rather than just using uh, some of the rate models that we have for 
for people have for criminal cells that try to capture the effects of uh, you know digital dendrites and everything. Good, good question. Um, I mean, I think specifically we were interested in the idea, although we're not there yet, as Peter uh, very clearly pointed out, we were specifically interested in this idea of, of imagining being able to have sort of feedback activity being integrated separately from your feed forward activity and that those things could live together um, at the same time. Um, but sure, no reason not to look at those. But th that, that was kind of the reason specifically to look at multi-compartment scenarios. I think we're going to take we'll a wrap break up. For okay. Lunch. Sure. Um, so, any other questions from you want to watch? Let's start again. At